and uh, and I was in the book of Colossians, and I re heard that scripture read, uh, and, and it just quickened to me, and I want you to turn to it, Colossians chapter 1, and Hebrews chapter 12, uh, well, would you stand with me tonight, we're talking about Jesus is, say that with me, Jesus is is. Stand with me tonight. And uh, 117 times, 117 times, you will find the phrase, he is, talking about God or Jesus in some form. A hundred, I don't know that I'll do 117 sermons on that, but I could, amen. I could. Somebody said to the alcoholic, he is the new wine. Somebody said to the drug addict, he is the Most High. Somebody said to the diseased, He is the great physician. Somebody said to the lonely, He is a friend that sticketh closer than any brother. Somebody said to the depressed, He is the glory and the lifter up your head. To the church, He is the Holy One in the midst of thee. To the dying, He is the resurrection and the life, world without end. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Somebody shout, He is tonight. And whatever you need, it's not found in a book, it's not found in a bottle, and it's not found at a bank. It's all found up in He, found in he is. And I've talked to you about He is the soon returning King. That ought to make you shout. Amen. He is Hallelujah. Last Sunday night, he is working. We had the documentation of the past, the confirmation of the present, consolation for the future. And next Sunday night, Lord willing, if he doesn't rapture us out of here and, I, and the God gives me the strength to preach, I'm going to preach on he is Jehovah Jireh. Amen. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. 1, verse 17. Say it with me. And he is before all things, and by him all things. Boy, when I was painting and I heard that passage, Brother Philip, streak of glory came in me. I think I got paint on my pants uh, and got excited. Uh, that I, when I heard those two words, he is, uh, I said, that's what we're going to preach. Because right then, that was during the insurrection, quote, unquote. That was the week of all that terrible things that happened. And I thought, what are we going? to do and I heard that scripture I read that scripture here's what we're going to do we're going to discover he is amen now tonight let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 I feel like I've already preached the sermon here in the introduction amen Hebrews chapter 12 uh, in verse 2 if you're there say amen looking unto who the author and finisher of our faith he is the author and finisher of our faith. Some of you online, you need to hear that tonight. Going through struggles, going through sickness, he is the author and finisher of our faith. Father, tonight, help us to remember that Jesus is, and we'll give you praise. May I decrease, may you increase, anoint your servant to preach, and everybody said amen, and turn around and tell somebody Jesus is as you're being seated tonight. I said Jesus is. If mankind's greatest need would have been financial, Jesus would have come as a banker. If mankind's greatest need, and I know we're suffering a pandemic, but if our greatest need was health, Jesus would have come as a doctor. If our greatest need was learning, he would have come as a professor. If our greatest need was political, and boy, they wanted him to be political, he would have come as a politician. But see, man's greatest need was not and is not financial. You may think that's a great need, but it's not the greatest need. Man's greatest need is not physical or educational or political. Man's greatest need is spiritual. And so he didn't come as a doctor per se, or as a philosopher, or as a banker. He came as a savior. The Bible says in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man is come, is, I like that word is, don't you? <laughs> he is, hallelujah, he is come to seek and save that which was lost. And that's what we're talking about when we say he is the author and finisher 
of our faith. So I want you to say that with me, but I want you to make it personal. He is the author and finisher of my faith. Say it with me. Ready? Three, two, one. He is the author and finisher of my faith. Everybody online, join in. Type it in the comments. He is the author and finisher of my faith. So I'm going to give you two points tonight. Number one, very easily to remember, he is the author of our faith. Somebody say author. In other words, he's the creator. He's the originator. People say, well, I found the Lord. Can I tell you something? God wasn't the one lost. You didn't find the Lord. Oh, but I'll tell you what, he found you. Somebody say amen. He originated our salvation. And you need to remember this in these times. And we get all in a tizzy on Facebook and we turn on fake news and, and what's going to happen and the economy and gas has already gone up and, and the Muslims have done this and the Arabs have done that and the Chinese have done this and the World Health Organization. We need to understand he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Why don't you give him a hand of prayer? Praise tonight. He's worthy of all the praise. He's the author of it. Acts chapter 4 and 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now, there are many who have offered salvation. There are many like Jim Jones. I Remember when I was a little kid and hearing about it on the news and some time ago, I believe the Discovery Channel or History Channel did a two or three hour expose on and reminded me of, of what that cult did and how he started as a preacher in Indiana, I believe it was Indiana, and grew a church and he moved out to California and very dynamic and, and but his doctrine be, began to, to have questionable things and, and, and he reached out to the poor, that was his attraction, he had a dynamic personality and then they went down to, uh, what's that place down there, Ghana? Okay, I want to make sure I had it right. And, uh, and of course, we know the ending of the story was when he got all of them to drink the, the lemonade. And, and now it's a phrase now, you know, or Kool-Aid, not lemonade, Kool-Aid. You drink the Kool-Aid. And, uh, and, of course, uh, you can hear recordings. Uh, they had actual recordings of people screaming as they were forced. Many of them were forced uh, to drink uh, the Kool-Aid and just terrible. But, but he offered salvation. But he's not the author of salvation. Then there was the hell bop comet. Do you remember back in the mid nineties the comet that stayed around for? Uh, uh, remember it was looking in the sky and you could see the trail of it. Uh, it was the hell bop comet. Comes around once every seventy five years. And and I don't know that many of us will be around the next trip. Uh, maybe so, maybe not. Uh, but uh, there was a, a cult leader named Marshall Applewhite. He had bald hair and he had big eyes and and he kind of he he offered salvation. Mohammed offered salvation. Uh, uh, Confucius offers uh, 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 Nirvana and salvation. Uh, but friend, uh, they may offer salvation, uh, but they cannot author salvation. Uh, there's only one author of salvation. There's only one who's provided it, the real deal, uh, and his name is Je He is the author of our salvation. Uh, has anybody met him? Has anybody been to the river and been baptized? Has anybody been saved. If you have, you ought to shout hallelujah. He is the author of our salvation. See, we're living in a day of pluralism, pluralism, and, and uh, basically that says, you know, doesn't matter what you believe or, or that's how you believe. And, uh, and I believe differently, but all roads lead to God. That's what your grandchildren are all into. That's what uh, your young people, that's why we as a church must reach young people. We must reach young families. Uh, we must reach teenagers and, and children's church. These things are vitally important. They are not incidental. Uh, they are fundamental. Uh, they must be a priority because they are getting all of this stuff. Uh, and we seniors in this church, most of us are 50 and older. Oh, I'll be 50 in a few months. I prophesied. Amen. Uh, most of, we've got to know that they're, they're under such an attack of pluralism. Uh, but look at what Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 9. He said, I am the door. Hallelujah. And I am uh, uh, by me. If any man enter in, uh, he shall be saved. 
He is, there, it's not all roads lead to God. There's only one road that leads to God. It's the Calvary road that leads to God. He's the author of our salvation. Amen? So whenever your grandkids start talking about this crazy mess, well, you know, everybody has their own path to God. Remind them. If you've ever been on an air flight, has anybody ever flown anywhere? Raise your hand if you've flown. You've gotten on. Okay. You know you have to go to the gate. Your ticket says gate A14 or gate B73. Well, ask your grandkids, have they ever flown anywhere? Most of them have. And ask them this simple question. Where were you flying to? Well, Grandma was flying to New York City. Well, when you got that ticket, did the ticket say at the top, all gates lead to New York City? No, you, if, you, if I can jog your memory, it said gate A14. If you were on gate A15, you were going somewhere else. If you were on gate A12, you were going somewhere else. You might have been close, but close. And when you get up to friendly skies, close ain't good enough. All gates do not lead to New York, and all roads do not lead to God. That's like taking I-95 south, thinking you're going to get to Elm City from here. Now, if from talking about from Westmoreland Church, if you get on I-95 South, you might get to Lake City, South Carolina, but you won't get to Elm City, North Carolina. I just moved to Elm City. That's why I don't want to throw that in there. Nelm City. Amen. Nelm City. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's a nice town. I've already, I, I've already gotten used, to, nice, adjusted to two weeks living out there. So quiet. But the same thing that says all roads lead to Elm City, tell your grandkids all roads do not. There is only one way of salvation. Uh, Muhammad is not the way. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 4 through 6. Uh, he is uh, the author. And you don't need to go Biden's way or Trump's way or anybody else's way. You need to go the way of Jesus. There is one body and one spirit even as you are called uh, and one hope uh, of your calling. Uh, verse 5. One Lord. One faith. Uh, one baptism. Uh, and uh, go to the next scripture. And one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Why don't you give him praise? He is the author of our salvation. Amen. Point one, he is the author of our salvation. Point two, he is the finisher of our salvation, of our faith. He's a finisher. I like the fact that he started it. He initiated it. You see, we didn't go up to God. God came down to us. Jane sang tonight and this morning, for God so loved the world that he gave. And not only did he provide salvation, but he will complete our salvation. Look at, first of all, he will finish what he started. He's the finisher of our faith. There's two aspects to that word finish. And I love, love it how you can get many uh, uh, truths from that one word there. He will finish uh, what he started in the sense of bringing to completion. In other words, he is not a quitter. He is the completer or he is the finisher of your salvation. In other words, he ain't going to quit on you. Turn around and tell somebody, he ain't going to quit on you. Now, your husband might have quit on you. And people might have quit on you. But that's a great joy to me because so many people think that they've got to struggle to get in. And hopefully, if they're good enough, they'll stay saved. Understand that we're in the book of Hebrews. And... The book of Hebrews was written to Jews who were trying to go back to works-based salvation or laws and sacrifices. Uh, but uh, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, I think we had a speaker a few weeks ago that said uh, another man wrote the book of Hebrews. I thought that was incredible. Um, we really don't know for sure, and I think he had a good point there. But whoever wrote the book of Hebrews uh, uh, likened it to a race. Uh, our Christianity is like, you know, the Roman world was really big, and the Greeks were really big in the races and the Olympics and all of that. Uh, and, and, and when you read the book of Hebrews, it talks about uh, running the race. Uh, and, uh, and what he's saying is that salvation is like running a race. Uh, we do our part. We run the race that is before us. But here's the difference. Jesus has not only put us in the race, 
but through salvation, but he's also racing through us. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, most of us remember Michael Jordan, but it'd be like me playing basketball and Michael Jordan was my coach. That'd be a pretty good coach, don't you think? I mean, he is still the king. Now, I know these guys come up with these new newfangled stars in the last 10 years. I don't know, LeBron James, all these guys, no, 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 no. You forget it. Uh, and I'm sure Pastor Nate would, would, would have something to say about that from his generation. But there's been one greatest that nobody's beat, Michael Jordan, yeah. So if he's a coach, uh, if he's my coach, I'm, I'm, I, my chances are a lot better. But I'm still Ricky Nelms. Come on now. And... Have you seen me try to get a ball up in that little basketball thing out here in the parking lot? You better not park your car close to it. In fact, I don't park my car over there. I park it over here for a reason. Because I've seen some of you try to do it. Amen. Come on. Even though I might have the great coach. Let me tell you something. What if Michael Jordan could step off of the sideline and step into me? And all of a sudden, I'm trying to throw a ball, and I can't do it to save my life, but the spirit of Michael Jordan hits me, and I throw that ball, stick out my tongue like that, like he did, and boom, it hits it. Come on now. And I'm doing three-pointers from half court, buddy. It ain't Ricky Nims. woo -hoo! It's Michael MJ, Michael Jordan. Woo, there he goes. And how about the slam dunk? Do you think I can get this up there to do a slam dunk? Ain't no way I'd have a I'd have a arrhythmia or something. Uh, come on here, but if Michael Jordan jumps in me, uh, man, I could lay it up, brother, and do a slam dunk. Uh, you see, that's what salvation is. Jesus not only got me in the game. And he's not only my coach to help me play the game, but in those critical moments, I'm about to shout, he'll jump inside of me and he'll help me do what I cannot do. Well, I can't teach that class. Honey, the spirit of the Lord can get in you and you can take a little sling and bring down a Goliath. I want you to know he's the finisher of my faith. He will see that it will come to completion. Whatever he's called me to do, whatever he's got for me, he will finish. He He's not going to give up on me. He's going to get all up in me if I let him. Uh, and he will uh, do what I cannot do. Somebody say amen. He started our salvation. And he'll finish. Jesus doesn't quit halfway. I may quit. And I'm so glad of that. The Bible says, for Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. And anybody that has a birthday, I'll put this scripture up there on Facebook. If I get time. I may miss your birthday. Because I don't go on Facebook every day. I go about once a week. Or I might scroll it every day, but I don't have time to comment because I'm just busy. But I put this up here. Philippians 1 and 6 says, being what? Of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you, what will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ? Oh, it's not how good you perform. It's how good he performs. Amen. You're not saved by grace and kept by sweat. God told Noah, he, didn't, he said, Noah, get in the ark. He didn't tell Noah, hang on to the ark. Amen, somebody. There's a big difference. He didn't say, Noah, you hang on to that ark now. It's going to get bumpy. And, and Noah, you better hang on tight. You know, that, rock, that boat will rock a little bit. Uh, you just hang on, son. I, I'll help you out as much as I can. No, he didn't say hang on to the ark. He said get into the ark. Amen. Uh, because Noah was safe. Uh, he wasn't hanging on. Uh, he was hanging in. Amen. Uh, I'm in the Lord Jesus Christ. And brother, this ship ain't going down. Uh, he's going to finish my salvation. Can you say amen? Now, does that, does that mean we can't backslide? No, but it means you don't have to backslide. A lot of people backslide because of repeated failure. Noah might have failed in that ark. He certainly failed after the ark. But he might have failed in the ark, but God didn't throw him overboard. And you don't have to jump overboard. Lots of the problem is God's not going to throw you overboard. A lot of people jump overboard. A lot of people go back to their sin, the very thing that will surely cause them to lose their soul. And, and people say, well, I just can't handle this. I fall and I fall. But my friend, uh, uh, that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, trust in the Lord. If you fall down, uh, look back to him uh, and say, Lord, I failed again and again. I've messed up. But oh, I'll tell you, he won't mess up. He would rather have you come back to him than go back to the world because he wants to finish what he started in 
in you. Did you know that the word backsliding, uh, it, it, and if you study it in the, in the King James Bible, is mentioned 14 times. I could go through all 14 scriptures. I just don't have time in this message tonight. But the last one, Hosea chapter 14 and verse 4, there's one last mention of the word backsliding. And I want you to see what it says. Here's what it says. I will heal their backsliding. Listen, out of those other 13 times, it says, don't backslide or be it, come back, you backsliding heifer. That's kind of strange language, amen. And uh, and uh, uh, the backslider shall be filled with his own ways. I could give you all those scriptures, uh, but God is like saying, let me give you the last word on backsliding. If you have a problem with it, uh, I will heal it uh, because I'm the author and the finisher of your faith. Come back home uh, if you failed the Lord uh, online. Those of you that are watching and you're so ashamed to come to church, come on back. He will heal your backsliding because he will finish your faith. Don't just hang on. Get into what God is doing. Get in the ark of the church. Get in the word of God. And I promise you, he'll be the author and the finisher. Well, that's worth shouting about right there. Glory to God. Amen. Now, finish means completion but there's another aspect of that word finish it not only means finish completion but also means finish and the process what what, what am i talking about like the finishing of a, a masterpiece or or when a car is Got everything in there. Got the engine in there. Got the carpet in there. Got everything. And then they put the paint on. And they and the finishing. Finish the paint. Or just puts a little shine to it. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm glad I got a little shine on me. Some, now, sometimes I don't shine like other times. Come on now. And neither do you. Uh, oh, but listen, uh, he's still finishing me. Amen. Uh, he's still smoothing out the rough edges. Uh, you know, you can, I had this picture of, uh, of my mentor, my father in the Lord, T.L. Bird. He, uh, when I was uh, uh, 18 years old, when I was 18 years old, I got a, uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, you would get a phone call from a pastor, take the offer he offers you. And, uh, and, and that was in May of 91, <clears throat> in September of 91, he called me and I knew immediately that's who it was. And never, one of the clearest times I've ever heard the Lord and T.O. Bird, uh, he said, son, he said, if you will stick with me and at the time I was preaching a lot of different churches. I was a young, cause I'm like Adam Fulgham, not on that level though. I mean, I'm never as good as that. He's Adam Fulgham is very unique, but, uh, but I was similar. I was, uh, a uh, young preacher preaching revivals and stuff. And I said, well, Brother Bird, I want to be available to go to other churches. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, if you'll commit to me, because I need a piano player and I need, I need somebody to help me. He said, if you'll commit to me, he said, I'll teach you everything I've learned in 50 years of ministry. And for half a minute, I'm like... I can't preach at this church and I can't preach at that church and he wants me to help him. And then I thought something hit me and said, wait a minute, you're going to learn 50 years worth of ministry. Man, those little places, just forget that. <laughs> I said, I'll be with you and I'll make a commitment. We made a covenant and, uh, and I found a picture of him when he was my age, when he was 49, 50 years old. And that picture was all messed up. I mean, he had black spots here and brown spots there and it, it's just an old but it's a color picture and had him in a suit he looks so good and handsome you know he's, he's passed away he passed away about 11 years ago and so I, I put that picture in a scanner and I got this program called um I don't forgot now Adobe Adobe uh, uh Photoshop and I pulled that picture up <laughs> And it said I could improve it. And so I took one of those little black spots and I, I, I circled around it. I clicked on a button and whew, that black spot was gone. And before I got finished, that picture looked like it was. And I sent it over to Walmart and had them to print it out. I'm telling you, Pastor Jerry, it looked like T.L. Bird's picture was made last week. That's what that's what how powerful that print, uh, computer program is. And my friend, if if photo if a <laughs> if Adobe Photoshop can make an old picture new and look like it just been took, my friend, what can God do to you and me? He's not finished with you, brother and sister. He's still working. You read your Bible last year. Guess what? You got one of those black spots knocked out. But you might have a few more you don't see. You know, when I blew that picture up, I saw stuff I couldn't see with the naked eye. Oh, but that oh he. He's finishing me. Uh, he's polishing. Uh, he's making me 
to be like his son. He's the author and the finisher. And that's why we need to be patient with people. Uh, that's why we need to pray for people. That's why we don't need to run people down. We need to pray for them and lift them up. Uh, because God's still working on your neighbor. Amen. Tell your neighbor, I know God's working on you. I had to pray for you every now and then. Tell them right now. Oh, we got to know he is. Why don't you give him a hand of praise that he's doing a work. clay in the potter's hand he makes it over and over again a certain woman decided to visit a silversmith and inquire about the process of refining silver which he described to her but sir do you just sit while the work of the refining is going on oh yes ma'am replied the silversmith I must sit with my eye steadily fixed on the furnace for the time necessary for refining be exceeded in the slightest degree, the silver may be injured. The lady at once saw the beauty and comfort of the phrase, he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. This is in the Old Testament. God sees it needful to put his children into a furnace. His eyes steadily intent on the work of purifying. And his wisdom and love are engaged into the best for the best of, for them both. Their trials do not come at random. As the lady was leaving the shop, the silversmith called back. By the, by the way, ma'am, the only way I know when the process of purifying is complete is when I look into that silver and I see my image reflected. Then I know the silver is pure. And when he looks at us, and when we reflect back to him, the graces and the fruit and the joys of, of his mercies and grace, then we'll know he's the finisher of our faith. Amen. It has been said that one of the great sculptors was asked how he did such phenomenal work. He said, when others see stone, he said, I see the finished product. Oh, really? He said, here's my secret. To sculpting great sculptures. I just see an image in that stone. And I just chip away. At everything. That doesn't look like. What I see in the finished product. Now I'll tell you what. He's still chipping on some things in Ricky Nelms. Amen. And he's my finisher. Ephesians chapter 2 and 10. Says. And you're going to see it in the King James. But I'm going to read it in the NLT. And I'm getting ready to close. But it says this. For. Listen to it in the NLT. That's what it says in King James. Uh, Brother uh, Blue was talking about the NLT. For we are God's, it says workmanship, but the NLT translates, translates it, and it's really more correct. For we are God's masterpiece. Might be a good idea to tell your spouse that they're a masterpiece every now and then. <laughs> Might be a good idea to tell your brothers and sisters. Go ahead and tell the neighbor, you're a masterpiece. Amen. We are God's masterpiece. And he's created us in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he's planned for us long ago. Long ago. Somebody say he's the author and the finisher of my faith. Somebody say he is the author and the finisher of my faith. I close with this, and Pastor Jerry is going to come up in just a moment. And, but I ran across this article. Let me read it to you. It is a bless you. Because he is. He is. Somebody say he is. You see, they had a problem. You know, people, Darnell and I, were, we've never been able to have natural children for various reasons. And uh, we've been to doctors, different things. Uh, but we were never able to have natural children. And it just boggles my mind that somebody can actually have a baby and then leave that baby in a trash can somewhere. It just, I just can't, it just doesn't compute with me because I think of how much, you know, we would have loved to have had children over the years. But I ran across this article and I feel like this will tie this message together. It says lawmakers in Nebraska, and this is about 10 years ago, lawmakers in Nebraska are looking at ways to revise the state's controversial safe haven law under which parents can drop their children at local hospitals without facing prosecution for child abandonment. Some parents coming to the state as far away from Florida 
appear to be using the no questions asked protections in unintended ways. So members of the Nebraska legislature met for a special session to discuss the revisions to the LB-157, the so-called safe haven law, which allows parents to surrender their children at hospitals without fear of prosecution. The problem is that the law, as it was written, contained no age limit for dropped off children. And some parents have dropped off their kids, one as old as 17. <laughs> Can you just see that? I'm going to stop here. Can you just see that conversation? If you don't take out your trash, I'm taking you to the hospital and leaving you, buddy. <laughs> no fear of being locked up. <laughs> As the Washington Post picked up in reports, when Nebraska legislatures passed a bill creating a safe haven to help overwhelm parents and guardians, they were thinking of babies and toddlers who had been abandoned by young mothers in a crisis situation. Instead, 35 children, typically adolescents, have been dropped off at the hospital. Uh, most recently, a five-year-old boy, the previous Thursday this article was written, a five-year-old boy just dropped off. The Lincoln Journal Star reports that the Speaker of the House introduced a bill Friday, or Friday when this article was written, in a special session that would limit the age of children uh, covered by the Nebraska Safe Haven Law to 72 hours. In other words, the child has to be no older than 72 hours. If you have a baby, you can safely abandon it at a near hospital. I just want to ask you as a close tonight. Aren't you glad that God has never needed a safe surrender law for us? Aren't you glad that he can put up with you longer than 72 hours? Aren't you glad he can put up with you longer than 17 years of age? Would you stand with me tonight and just praise him that he's going to put up with you for all eternity. You are his, uh, and he is, he is the author and the finisher of your faith. He's not going to surrender you. He's not going to get mad with you. He's not going to say, I'm, I've tried and I'm going to give up. Uh, oh, my friend, he's going to stay with you. You just get in and, and you just love him and praise him in this pandemic. We're going to make it through. Uh, God is our healer. Be encouraged tonight. Somebody shout, he is. He is. He is. Give him praise here tonight. Amen. Glory to God. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is. I love that. Looking unto Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. I like the last part of it. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame here's where we need to see him he sat down at the right hand of his majesty on high i'm taking a course working on another doctorate degree and what this course is on strongholds and pastor ricky i had to take five strongholds out of that list that were in my life and how i overcame them praise god and on every one of them I put my testimony in there about Jesus. And I ended every one of those comments with, he's still working on me. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not a finished product yet. Even the apostle Paul said, I haven't apprehended it all, but I'm in the press. I'm pressing toward the mark of the high calling for the prize of Christ Jesus. The high calling. And I often think about God, and he's like the elusive butterfly. He says, come on up hither. And you seek God, and you reach that level. And you say, well, God, I'm here. And he's like the butterfly. He just floats on up a little higher and says, come on up here. Yes. He's the finisher of our faith. And I love this, Pastor Ricky. He will never leave us. Hallelujah. Nor forsake us. <laughs> Glory. That he has promised that I am with you. 
Father, we thank you so much for the word tonight. And Jesus, we thank you that we didn't manufacture this faith. It's a gift of God. And Lord, we just praise you that we belong to you. And Lord, we yield ourselves to the flame of your word. Lord, wash us, oh, cleanse Lord. us, purify us, refine us. So like that silver that Pastor Ricky had in his message, that when you look at us, Father, you see a mirror reflection of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord, and we praise you for your word. Thank you for your church and for the name above every name. Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And Lord, that joy was that we could be conformed to his image and know you, Father. In Jesus' name, the church said, Amen. Look at three people and tell them you are blessed and highly favored of God. You are blessed, blessed, blessed. You are blessed, my brother, Pastor Ricky, and highly favored yes. of God. Glory.